Okay, if you can just state your name and when you joined. Is this for prison? No. <laughs> no, well, my name is Graham Fern. I joined the Trinity House Service in 1946, retiring in 1991, I do believe. Now, what else would you like to know? Uh, rank when you left. Yes, I was very, yes. <laughs> yes, PK. I started off as SAK, ended up as PK. I went to about 25 different stations, starting off at, apart from the training school, starting off at Lundy South as a super, ending up at Cromer as PK, and then attendant for a short period before I left altogether. So what was your training like and where did you go? Well, in those days we used to have a training school at Blackwall workshops where of course it ended up after it had flitted to Harwich and then came back again. And uh, But it was a bit rudimentary uh, because there was, uh, it was nearly oil, oil lamps and incandescent lights. So it, um, it was more to do with incandescent lights and um, not splices, metalwork, woodwork and so on and so forth. And as you probably know yourself, most of the training you do the first year when you're out station and learning it on the job. But I never did get all my certificates, actually. I, I left I left after all those years untrained <laughs> because I never got all the certificates and tickets in that I should have had. I, didn't, I never had a radio beacon ticket and I never had a GPO RT ticket and I used the RT, you know, the radio telephone, VHF, all those years and they never caught caught on that I hadn't got a ticket. <laughs> so if the GPO were listening to this, that's all lies. <laughs> so what um, stations have you been on then? Uh, I've been to Lundy South, Flatholm, Heartland Point, South Bishop, Skokum, um, Nam Tower. Spurn Point, Whitby, Bull Point, Bishop Rock, Round Island, Blizzard, Nash Point, Europa Point, North Foreland, St. Catharines, and Cromer. I'm called in at one or two others en route. Did you, um, with Spurn Point, can you tell us about that one? Yes, well, that, that was a land station up to the beginning of the First World War, and then it became a rock. And it was a two handed rock when I was there. Three handed in the winter, two handed in the summer. And no fog signal, so you just kept watches at night. And, and, and the gorgeous thing about it was, it was the biggest hyper-radial lens that was ever built by Chance Brothers and uh, you used to wind up every 45 minutes and there was about 200 turns on the clock so if you if you knocked off for a smoke after you've done 150 turns if you knocked off for a smoke <laughs> by the time you finish your smoke the weight was down the bottom again so you had to wind it up again uh, and for anybody who doesn't know what on earth I'm talking about, I'm talking about the, the clock and the weights that drive the lens, which works very much like a grandfather clock, uh, which you yourself know, and you wind the weights up on Saturday night, and it goes all week, but on a lighthouse lens, it doesn't go that long, and it's a bigger damn weight as well. <laughs> and we used to have a PK there called Old, uh, old Bill Newby, who must be dead now, and uh, Bill was then 58, and he was a very tall, thin, wiry man, and he couldn't wind up in one go, so he used to wind about 100 odd turns up, and then he, then he used to stop for a breather, and by the time he'd had his breather, the weight was down the bottom again, so he, he used to have a very horrendous night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then it was, it was automated while I was there, and... Uh, Worked all worked from acetylene gas, and uh, the keepers were taken away. In fact, I was the last keeper there. I locked it up and handed the key over to the attendant, 
Uh, and since those days, of course, it's been closed down completely. And apart from being still standing there as a tower and a day mark, it doesn't work at all. You went to Europa Point as well, Gibraltar. Yes. Mm. What, was, what was that station like? Well, that was very nice. I enjoyed that because I only went for six months to do holiday duty because in those days, as far as I can remember, they used to have their annual leave by yearly I think. Anyway, the essence of it was I went for six months. I went from April to, uh, to October and my wife and daughter came out as well. And it was very enjoyable. Uh, I wouldn't have liked to live there long term because I miss green fields mm. and uh, it's very dry there. But it was very educational. I learnt all about Spanish smugglers. <laughs> uh, very nice people, actually. Um, the Trinity agent there, the, or the superintendent, as you would call him, was the captain of the port. It's a Captain Ricard. And he came up to the lighthouse one early one evening to walk his dog. And I stood talking to him, and he said to me, do these smugglers give you any hassle because the the smugglers motorboats used to come round from the harbour under to under the lighthouse and they would wait there to see where the Spanish gunboats were to see whether they were going to go across to La Linea Morocco or up the coast to Malaga and depending where the Spanish gunboat was was we, which way that the, the the smugglers motor launch would go so they used to have a, like a tic-tac man on the top and he would be there with binoculars looking for the, the gunboats and he would be shouting down in Spanish to the coxswain of the motor launch. So you'd have all this yelling and shouting and screaming for about five or ten minutes and then once they decided where they'd go and they'd go. So I was explaining all this to the captain of the port and, and uh, explaining, you know, that it went on for a few minutes. But I said, it's no hassle because we know after a few minutes they'll have gone. And as you probably know, Gibraltar's a free port anyway. Uh, and so the captain of the port, after he heard my story, said, yes, well, well, that's all right. But he said, if you, if you do have any hassle, he said, just let me know and I'll have a word with them. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was, was quite yeah. quaint, really. <laughs> the Tower Rocks, you did the Bishop Rock. Yes, Bishop Rock, yes. Was that the two months on time? Two months on and a month ashore, yes. So eight, what, eight weeks on, four what weeks What was that on. like? Well, eight weeks is quite a long time out of your life, really. You go off there, and when you get back, your children are eight weeks older, uh, sometimes a bit more. But I, I was quite lucky, actually, in as much as when there was any amount of overdue, I always seemed to be ashore. Uh, I had more, more overdue time ashore than I had overdue time on the rock. But uh, I used to find it quite, quite quaint that in, in latter years blokes are being relieved by helicopter and they're complaining about minutes and hours and I was used to overtime of days and weeks uh, you know I could really couldn't understand what they were moaning about when I when I've been a week overdue or, or even more and, and that was that was quite quite a small amount in the winter can you explain sort of grubbing up for two months at a time yes well uh, I always believe in looking after your stomach. So I used to grub up well. And Trinity House used to pay, and they still do as far as I know, pay a bickling allowance uh, at so much a day. So you can buy your own food, so you buy what you like, and you don't have to buy, you don't have to eat what somebody else likes. And uh, what you had to do was to, to, was to bickle up for four weeks. And, uh, and in those days, there was no deep freezers, only fridges. So you had to, to uh, arrange to have four weeks' food and you used to have to make your own bread, etc., etc., etc. And if you don't make bread, you don't eat. Mm. And it's quite as simple as that. Uh, so you soon learn to cook. Of course, in this day and age, with deep freezers and frozen foods, catering is relatively simple, but, but in those days, it was you had to put a lot more thought into it because... Um, fresh vegetables and fruit will only keep so long and you, so you had to look after your food and then you, you would take a month's food with you and then you would arrange for another month's food to follow you in four weeks time when the next relief was done and uh, and in those days lighthouses, rock lighthouses used to have a big surplus of 
emergency rations. So you could always draw on the emergency rations if you were long term overdue. But most keepers had enough food in the lockers to uh, to last for overdue, if you know if necessary. What was it like in bad storms in the winter when you had to batten down for weeks? Or? Well, on a tower rock. Well, well, first of all, all these stories you read in books by these authors of books who don't even know what they're talking about, whereby the, the keeper sees a cup and saucer sliding up and down the table in a storm. Well, that, that's all rubbish for a start, because uh, uh, when I was on Bishop Rock, we, 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 we went into this theory of, of how much the, the table would have to tip for the cup and saucer to go flying down, as it does in some of these storybooks. And we worked it out that the, that the tower would be about 45 degrees before the cup slid. <laughs> so we didn't think there was much truth in that. But, uh, uh, of course, what you have to do in, in all these towers, you have to batten down storm shutters, which are made of phosphor bronze, so they don't rust, and the entrance doors, which are phosphor bronze, and you bolt all down with bolts, and you just shut everything up and you just wait till the storm finishes and uh, then you can go and let some fresh air in. The, the other thing I will say is that Bishop Rock is 168 feet to the weather vane and I've been there in storms with seas over the top. Not every day, <laughs> occasionally. And I expect there's plenty of other keepers been there uh, who've experienced the same thing. It does shake. Well, you do get a little shake, but... Uh, I suppose if you've never been on a lighthouse before and you get plonked there and there's a, there's a storm the first night, it must be quite terrifying, really. But uh, you just say, when you hear a bash and the tower shakes, you say, my word, that was a big one. And uh, uh, it's all to do with the direction of the sea and the waves and everything combined. You know, you can. I used to notice on the bishop if you had a, a southeasterly gale so that the seas and the weather came slap on to the south side of the tower where the entrance door was, you get the tower would shake more than if it was coming from the east or the west, east or the west, or the north. Not very nice, anyway. Hobbies. Hobbies. Well, great, great things, hobbies. Now, television spoiled hobbies. That's, that's the worst thing about television, it's spoiled hobbies. Um, before television, everybody had a hobby or had two or three, map making, rug making, tapestry, embroidery, carpentry. I was at one lighthouse where everybody played chess, so it was a big chess month. And I was with one PK, now dead and gone, to the big lighthouse in the sky, but um, he was a great chess player. So when he arrived for his first trip, he said, does anybody here play chess? So he said, yes, yes, we all play chess. Oh, well, I love chess. And he said, uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm all for chess, I love it. And he also said that he didn't believe in hanging about at watch time. As soon as watches were relieved, he believed in the man who was relieved going to bed immediately, or within a few minutes. So, uh, the month started and he was calling me for watch. So he called me for watch, he'd finish his cup of tea and then he'd say, I'm off. About ten past the hour and I used to say, you don't fancy a game of chess, do you? <laughs> <laughs> and he'd say, well I can't resist it. So we'd have a game of chess and one would win. Then I'd say, fancy another game, especially if he'd lost. So we'd have another game and then perhaps he won. So well, we'll have to have another game to find out who's going to win out of three. And he used to go to bed just before me at four o'clock. <laughs> and he used to say, you've done it again. <laughs> uh, but a lot more, lot, more, lot more hobbies in those days, a lot more hobbies. And it, I mean, it was, it was um, a lighthouse was almost like the Women's Institute going up full strength, you know, everybody on Arby. And, uh, but as far as I can see, the hobbies have nearly all finished now. It's all sit and watch the goggle box. Was there more sort of camaraderie between keepers in those days? 
Uh, well, I I like to think there was. Now, this this may be that it's my age showing, you see. <laughs> uh, but I think there was more camaraderie in those days. There was more sharing and giving and taking, and certainly more more humour than there is now. Or it seemed to me so in the latter years that uh, there was more humour when I was younger than there is in the latter years. But uh, lighthouse jokes are usually very long and complicated and, and well thought out. And I mean, I can recall being on Bishop Rock with a with a brand new supernumerary who'd never been on a lighthouse before, and uh, and one of us would have a shave and a wash and brush your hair, and and the other one would say. Uh, not the young one, the other one that's been in the co with him. You going to show? He said, oh yes, I'm, I'm going to have pictures actually. There's a good film on this week. And the young keeper looks up and thinks, what are these two on about? You know? Yes, well, well, it is your turn this week. And they, oh yes, yes, I should pop off in a minute. And you keep this going for quite some time before the, the young keeper realises that there's a, there's a joke going there, but he's not quite sure which way it's going really. Or I, I, the, the other one I had was, which I always thought was very funny. I was on Bishop Rock and we were sounding for fog. It was a summer day, summer's day. And it was this low lying fog like cotton wool, you know, that lays over the sea. And you can't see the sea below you at 150 odd feet. But you could see St Agnes, which is, what, about five miles away? St Agnes Lighthouse. And, and the ship keeper was on watch and he was sounding for fog. So you couldn't you couldn't see the sea, but the sun was shining, and he he was out of the gallery with binoculars round his neck, and we were using the old fog signal gun in those days, the four ounce tonite charges, and he would let one off, bang, you know, and then he'd go out with the glasses and say yes. Well, we're aiming for St Agnes, so up a hundred gunner. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get it on the next salvo. Uh, which is quite a stupid thing, really, but it was, it's quite humorous when you're there at the time. <laughs> Did keepers ever get what I call rock happy, you know, some of these old people? Well, uh, I don't quite know what you mean, really, Peter. What, what do you mean by rock happy? You know, some of these people get stuck in their ways and they're a bit... Oh, yes. Yeah, 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 terrible, aren't they? No, not so much of latter years. I was, at a lot, I was at South Bishop years ago, I was off the Welsh coast, and we had a PK there, no names, no pack drill. And I noticed that in the pantry, during the month, there would grow a long line of empty evaporated milk tins. And uh, you know, you, with evaporated milk, when you use it, you used to punch two holes in, two little holes, one for the milk to come out, one for the air to go in. And I noticed that over the two little holes there was a little metal plate soldered on, you see, so it was airtight. And I used to watch this row of tins grow, you see. And the PK, when I went to shore, the PK had another month to do before he went to shore. And when I came back I noticed all these tins had disappeared. So I said to one of the other keepers one day, what are all these tins that keep appearing? All soldered up and made airtight, and then they all disappear again. Ah, he said, these are the PK's lifesavers. So I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he, he doesn't trust Buddy Finch life jackets or anything like that, so, or any other posh life jacket. So on relief day, the last thing he does, he stuffs all his pockets with these tins. <laughs> So that when he goes down into the boat, into the motor launch in the landing, before he goes over to the tender, if it sinks, he's going to float with all these milk tins. <laughs> and then when he gets on board, he throws them all over the side. <laughs> Can't believe it, can you really? Oh, is that what you mean, lighthouse? Yes, exactly <laughs> what I mean. <laughs> and this, this same lighthouse keeper, this same old PK, he was a big smoker. And I also noticed that in the lantern there was always a, an old cocoa tin full of cigarette ends and there was another one in the entry room where the fog signal equipment was. And I said one day, who is this person who keeps these 
tinge of dirty, filthy fag ends in the lantern and in the engine room. I said, they're quite revolting. Don't touch those boys. They're my lifesavers. When I'm all smoked up and overdue, they what I go for. <laughs> oh, I can tell you a story about talking about smoking. I was off on a lighthouse uh, and this super had, who we'd had for a month had to stop another month. And he sent his food order in and they forgot to send his tobacco. So he, he was virtually smoked up and he had a month to go. So it was suggested he could smoke tea. <laughs> so he started smoking tea, you see. Foul smelling stuff. Anyway, after about a week or so, I called him for watch one night and I had the kettle boil in, made the tea, and he, he guzzled about three cups of tea in, in just about as many minutes. And I said, oh, so and so, I said, you're thirsty tonight, aren't you? He said, no, no, I'm not thirsty, he said, I just want to smoke. And he said, if I smoke all my tea leaves, my tea, I shan't have any tea left. So he said, I take the tea first. He said, I'm going to dry all these leaves in the oven, and then I shall use them for smoking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, what a good yarn. Anything? <laughs> I, w I, wouldn't, I wouldn't advise you to smoke tea leaves. Were you ever on um, Plymouth Breakwater? No, no, I haven't been on Plymouth Breakwater. I've heard a lot of stories about Plymouth Breakwater, and most of them are quite unprintable. <laughs> <laughs> um, I take it you've enjoyed your life as a keeper? Yes, yes. Uh, you learn a lot. And you go back to Plymouth Breakwater, I can tell you a story about Plymouth Breakwater by a PK who was just recently died, actually, at a great age. Uh, and he was a good PK and he called, spades were called spades. And uh, <coughs> the tender came up from Penzance, storing up. And the, P uh, and the motorboat came in with oil and coal. And the PK said to the officer in the boat, would you be topping up our water tank? And so the officer in the boat said, no, no, we we're only bringing coal and more coke and water. He said, you had your ration of water last time we came. So the PK said, oh, well, I, I just wondered if you were or you weren't. It doesn't matter to me. So the boat, they topped him up with coal and oil. And away they went. So the PK then got out his report book. Well, he made, a, he made an indent out for a length of five-eighths chain and a padlock. And he sent a report in with it that he had just discovered today from THB Satellite's crew that water was now rationed in the Trinity House service, which was quite new to him. And so could the superintendent please tell him what the ration of water was per day? And he had indented for a length of chain and a padlock. So that each morning, once he knew what the ration was, he would then dish out the ration of water to each man, then lock up the pump. <laughs> and he posted that, and he'd hardly posted it, and he saw this pool of smoke coming up on the horizon, and that was a satellite, the tender satellite coming up from Penzance. And they came in with a load of water. And the officer in the boat, who was the same one who had come up with the coal and water, coal and oil the previous week, I said, what are you doing complaining about water? He said, well, I'm not complaining about water. When you said last week we'd had our ration, I was just asking what the ration was. I'm not complaining. Well, you don't need to write letters like that. No, he said, well, I'm only repeating what you said. And uh, I thought that was a very good story. And, and I've always remembered that. So when somebody bounces a ball at you, the best thing to do it's bouncing straight back. <laughs> and I've always remembered that. Right, thanks very much, Graham. Is that enough? Yes, that's enough. Oh, very good. Thank you.